I'm uh, extremely pleased to welcome our two special guests. Um, and I'm just going to give uh, brief introductions, and then I'll turn it over to them, and they will um, each speak in turn. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have a little uh, Q&A, so I hope you can stay for that. And of course, there are refreshments afterwards, so you can help yourself with those as well, too. So um, let me start with uh, Bao Fi, who's been a spoken word poet for over two decades. Um, he has two collections of poems, which are both published by Coffee House Press. Song I Sing and Thousand Star Hotel, um, the latter which was nominated for the Minnesota Book Award and was chosen as 2017's Best Poetry Book of the Year by the San Francisco State Poetry Center. He's also the author of um, a children's book, A Different Pond, which, is, uh, which um, uh, won multiple awards, including a Caldecott and Ezra Jack Keats, um, Asian Pacific American Library Association Award, uh, Minnesota Book Award, and several others. It was on um, best books of the year lists um, uh, from a number of publications. He also had a second children's book called My Footprints, which was um, released uh, by Capstone just last year and was named the best fiction book for young readers by the Chicago Public Library. And he is currently the director of events and awards at the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis, where he lives with his 10 year old daughter. Um, and our uh, next speaker is Kao Kalia Yang, who's a Hmong American writer who um, uh, was born in the refugee camps uh, in Thailand after her family escaped the genocide of the secret war in Laos. Um, and then she came to America at the age of six, and she has degrees from Carleton College and Columbia University. Uh, Kalia is the author of The Late Homecomer, a Hmong family memoir, which was the winner of the 2009 Minnesota Book Awards in Creative Nonfiction Memoir, um, and a finalist for the Penn USA Award in Creative Nonfiction and the Asian Literary Award in Nonfiction, um, and was also nominated for several other awards. Her second book, The Song Poet, won the 2016 Minnesota Book Award in Creative um, Nonfiction. Um, memoir and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Chautauqua Prize, the Penn USA Award, and again, several other ones as well, too. Um, and um, that book was, is the first mom story um, adapted into an opera by the Minnesota Opera, which is amazing, uh, which will premiere next year, uh, so we can all look forward to that. Um, she's also the author of several children's books, um, A Map into the World. <coughs> Um, which uh, won the North Star Best Illustrator Award and was a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award in Children's Literature. And she is also the co-editor of a collection titled What God is Honored Here, writings on miscarriage and infant loss by and for indigenous women and women of color um, from the University of Minnesota Press. Um, uh, she also has um, a couple of children's books forthcoming, The Shared Room, and The Most Beautiful Thing, and um, a collective memoir about refugee lives entitled Somewhere in the Unknown World. Um, she's uh, a writer, a teacher, a public speaker. <laughs> um, and um, so uh, I'm uh, extremely pleased to uh, welcome these two special guests to UIC. Please join me in welcoming you to the stage. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. You kind of have to hold it straight up to you. Got it. Okay. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Are you all usually in class or in transit right now? Like, uh, uh, I'm ditching class. Ditching class? Good for you. Thank you. Thank you for ditching. Um, it's glad to be here. I'm glad to be here with you all. Thanks to Mark and actually everyone involved in bringing us out. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's great to have this opportunity to be with you. Uh, you know, I started writing poetry as a, you know, kid from a poor refugee family in high school. So the, the idea of being able to travel and share my work with people is always a blessing for me. So thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And it's always good to uh, be on the same bill as Kalia, who is going to go second, and then we're going to do a conversation. Uh, you know, it's so funny, we're from the same town, but we rarely get asked to do stuff together. Because it's like they pick like one refugee, like one Southeast, Southeast Asian refugee, 
at a time. So it's dope to be able to do like a refugee focus thing where both of us get to be uh, on the bill at the same time. It's cool. So thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm a poet, um, and I my second book of poems, um, a lot of it has to do with my refugee experience growing up. So what I'm going to do first is tell you a little bit about how I came to the United States and then merge into the poetry part of it. So I was born in 1975, just three months before the other side rolled their tanks into Saigon. I'm a Vietnamese person, I was born there. Uh, my father was in the Southern Vietnamese Army on the, aligned with the United States for 10 years. Um, and so we had to flee. And a shortcut of that story is that originally, I come from a mixed family in that two of my siblings they're, they're actually my cousins, and their parents were killed during the war. And so, because we were a mixed family, when we were fleeing, at first, the American GI who was standing there with the clipboard was not gonna let us all through, if that makes sense, to get to the planes. Because he was like, these are not your biolog biological children. There was like tears. There was discussion about my grandfather, whether or not he could come with us or stay behind. Um, and then my father was still technically in the military, so he couldn't leave either, right? There was all these tears, and then the other side, the Communist Party, started shelling the airport, um, trying to kill as many of us as possible. So when that happened, the GI holding the clipboard dropped it and ran. And that's how my whole family rushed through. It's because of that moment of chaos and fear. We rushed through in the moment, along with many other Vietnamese people. And it didn't end there, so basically, through that entire time, the other side was shelling the airport. And my father, the story my father tells is that things were so chaotic that basically anyone who knew how to fly a plane could get in a plane, load it up, and try to escape. The problem was the communists were trying to kill us, and so he saw plane after plane full of these people get incinerated. And so what we did was we, we stayed in a bomb shelter um, for hours overnight hoping that the shelling would cease. Um, I was a baby in my parents' arms. Uh, everyone, I don't remember any of it. I was the youngest. Everyone said I was a very chill baby. I didn't cry through any of it. They were like, yeah, you were cool. You were all right. You know, like, uh, didn't make much of a noise. Um, and then we finally took our chance. And then um, my dad wasn't supposed to get on the plane that we took our chance on, but he hopped on at the last minute. So he's technically a deserter. Um, that was always like, a, I'm telling you this, it all goes into like why I'm a writer in my story. That's what always never made sense to me because in the first wave of Vietnamese refugees who came, most of them had connections, right? Or some money, and we did it. We were poor. My dad wasn't a high ranking officer. He didn't have connections in America. I'm like, how did we all make it? One, it was because, of, and, they have, and it never made sense because he kept some stuff from me. Number one, it was because of that moment where the, where the gatekeeper dropped his clipboard. And two, he wasn't actually supposed to go with us. He just hopped on the plane at the last minute. So technically, he's a deserter. And he never said anything because he didn't want to. And he didn't tell me until about five or six years ago because now he's old and he doesn't give a fuck anymore. You know what I mean? He's like, yeah, whatever, right? Um, so, I mean, and I didn't know this about him. And so we came from that. We bounced around refugee camps. Um, and, you know, I want to make this point because I think now the narrative is that oh, like refugees, like America was kind enough to open its arms to Southeast Asian, Vietnamese, Hmong refugees after the war, like it was a charity case or something. I want to very clearly state and plainly state that America, we were allies to the United States, to the military and the government, and they promised they would take care of us if anything bad happened. And they actually didn't keep their full promise. So they let some of us in. But they put the responsibility of taking care of us under the nonprofit sector instead of actually assisting us, right? I just want to make that very clear because I think there's a narrative now that like Southeast Asians like we're lucky is like, no, y'all actually broke the promise. So you needed a sponsor. You were in a refugee camp and you needed a sponsor, an American family sponsor, before you could get out of the refugee camp to come to America. And a lot of those sponsors tended to be Christian charity come from Christian charity groups. 
So the story goes is that the two offers we received, one was from California, and back then all the Indigenous people had heard about California. Sunny California, we heard about it, Golden Promised Land, right? But the family who offered the sponsorship there said, if you come, you have to convert to Christianity. Like that was their condition. And my mom, David Buddhist, was like, no, no, not even come to America, I'm not doing it. And then the second was from a place in Minnesota. We never heard of Minnesota before. They were also Christian, but they said, you know, even though we're Christian, we want you to go to church and learn about Christianity, but you don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to convert. And you know, of course, Vietnamese are very direct people. So we did not understand Minnesota passive aggressiveness. You know what I mean? <laughs> we did not understand that the Lutherans were like, oh, you don't have to convert to Christianity. We just want you to learn and if you would convert to Christianity, that'd be great, but you don't have to, right? We didn't understand that. So shortcut, uh, we ended up in Minnesota. Uh, I was raised in the Phillips neighborhood of South Minneapolis, which is Minneapolis' largest, largest, most racially diverse neighborhood. It is where the American community was started in the mid-70s. Um, two blocks from my parents' houses, uh, Little Earth, which is one of the few, if not only, Native American housing projects in the United States. Um, it was, during its heyday, the largest urban Native American center in the continental, in North America. Um, things have changed now with Canada and various other things. But that's the environment I grew up in. Um, that's where my parents still live. Um, I'm raising my daughter not too far from there uh, in a neighborhood called Powerhorn. Um, and with that, I'm gonna segue. Uh, I, I started doing poetry as a speech team kid in high school. And uh, I got a full ride to a small liberal arts college. And I, 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 uh, I majored in English, much to the chagrin of my parents. Um, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. So. One thing I should also mention is that Southeast Asian families like mine, not just Vietnamese, but Hmong, Lao, Cambodian, Thai, we were the first big groups of Asians to come to Minnesota. There, like, there were other Asian people there before, but not like big enough groups for people to be like, oh, who, what is this? You know what I mean? Like, what the hell is happening? I mean, there were articles in the paper saying that we were stealing people's pets and eating them. Like we were, um, and there was a there was an article, and this is in the mainstream press, not like a like a crackpot white supremacist paper. This was in the Minneapolis Star before they merged with the Star Tribune, so the one of the major newspapers. The Minnesota Daily ran an article about how um, we were Vietnamese gangsters had taken over the pool hall, Kaufman Union at the University of Minnesota and then we planned murders in our language over billiards, and then we would kill you if you looked at one of our, quote, women, like our women. Like their words, not mine. So, you know, like, we were, we were among the first, and uh, there's another scholar, Cindy Wu, who then remarked that because of that, Asians in Minneapolis are seen through the lens of war. Like, all Vietnamese people, Asian people, are seen through a very specific lens of war, like the enemy, basically either the victims or enemies. But as a kid, and this is a segue into my first poem, I promise. As a kid, my parents, you know, dealt with being in a strange land where no one wanted them with other Vietnamese people by often going to these um, cultural events, right? So the, and the older Vietnamese, so older Vietnamese people are fucking fabulous. I don't know how, they like, they would get to, they would have these events, they would get dressed up, they would dance, and they could dance. Right? And they would recite poetry and they'd argue about politics and there would be food and drinking. Um, and then those of us like me, like, like little kids, we would find a room away from all of them, right? To, to, I don't know, like play cards, tell jokes. And also, we would sometimes go, we would leave the building and go try to find stuff like video games. And back then, video games were in a cabinet. Uh, like sometimes in an arcade or at the front of a grocery store, you put a quarter in, you get three lives. It's crazy, right? And so this poem is about one of those times. It's called Refugees from the Prom Center in the 80s. And uh, the Prom Center was a St. Paul, like VFW building that they would rent, Vietnamese folks would rent, like once a year for one of these things. <clears throat> Who says Asians can't dance? Have you ever seen old Vietnamese people cha-cha and tango, like their feet and hips asked to be colonized? 
You can't handle them, so you don't. I'm walking away with kids older and taller, blocks away, the promise of video games in some arcade, or maybe the front of a store. I hate Vietnamese people, one of the boys says suddenly, scowl like a blue marble switchblade. I hate my own people, he laughs, to make sure we get it. I've only got one quarter, so I hold it in my palm and watch the other kids play, including the aider, who puts his quarter into a slot, does his best to control his one man on three. I can't remember what game he played, or whether I care that he hated Vietnamese people, like me, like him. No, that's a lie. I know I didn't care. I was rooting for him, even after I saw him lose life after life. So that's a, that's a little poem about internalized racism, um, something that I still struggle with as an adult. I hope my daughter doesn't have to, but, I, but it has. Um, this next poem is more about like regular old external racism. Um, my mom is a, a terrific gardener, always ask her. And hey, come on in. Come on in. There are plenty of seats in the front. If you like to sit in the front, there's plenty of seats. So I don't know if you've had these stories that they're called Frank's version and crafts and uh, you know, I being the youngest, I would tag along with my parents to all these different things. And this is about an argument my mom had at a store when she tried to buy plants and she argued with the cashier. <clears throat> the lines are long. And my mom insists that the final amount on the receipt was wrong. The cashier looks at the receipt and insists that it's right. My mom purses her lips, looks worried, says it's not right. The line of white people behind us runs. My mom will look back at them. We both know what they're thinking. Small women with no knowledge of the way things are in America. The year after year, she makes flowers bloom in the home. Petals in the face of this land that doesn't want her. Here. Finally, the manager comes, checks, and tells the cashier she rang up 22 pence instead of just two. Overcharging us by $40. My mother holds my hand, leads me away without looking back at the line of white people who overhear and gasp. <gasps> There's something wrong. If only I was old enough to tell them to keep it. It's not my mom's English. That's right. Yeah, so I think sometimes I just became a poet so I could clap back at all these racist motherfuckers. <laughs> that I didn't have the vocabulary or the mindset to when I was 10 and witnessed all this shit happening to my, to my family. Um, not that it's any less racist now, actually. But, um, so now I'm a dad. And you know, my dad went through some shit too. Like usually um, because of time, I pick either the poem about my mom or the poem about my dad, even my mom today. My dad went through some shit too. Um, uh, then I'm gonna read this poem about my daughter, because being a dad, um, you know, I mean, the reason I got into kids lit, children's literature, writing books, and why I'm grateful for books like Kalia's is that, you know, um, my daughter has shown, uh, like unease and shame about being Asian. And she, you know, we have to continually have conversations with the teachers. We don't live in a all white area. Like my daughter's school is 80% black and brown, 85% uh, free to reduce lunch. So it's not like she's living in an all white summer. She's not learning anything about Asian and Asian American people. This is a constant discussion that we have to have with their educators who are good people, overpaid, overworked, but there's nothing in the curriculum that teaches any kids about Asian people. And it's not just for my daughter, all people should be learning about Asian I'm preaching to the bar, you're all about Asian American stuff. So, um, <laughs> so, but you hear what I'm saying. You hear what I'm saying, right? Um, but also, and you know, like, well, what I'll say is um, my daughter, I mean, I'm not rich, but my daughter has a way better time. Than, than me, right? In terms of class, at least. 
But there are still times when she's shown that she knows where I come from and that she, like, that's a lot of her fear. And this next poem is about that. Um, it's about us going to the circus. This is my first time at the circus and her first time. Because you know, when you're a parent coming from a poor family and you have a kid, you're like, my kid is going to have everything that I didn't get. So you're going to get all these toys and Cheetos and all of that. So one, one, uh, one day I decided to appear in the circus because, well, here's the point. It's called Lex. A small handle with fiber optic cables spraying like snakes from Medusa's head. Press a button and tiny colored dots at the end of the translucent strings with light. The day after the Shrine Circus, all the kids in my class had them, waving them. My dad asked me if he'd ever broken a promise, and I said nothing. He never took me to the circus because he didn't have the money, not because he couldn't keep a promise. How do you say that to your father? Almost 30 years later, my daughter and I go to the circus, first time for both of us. She holds my hand and wants to run past the bouncy castles, the face painting, the pony rides, all things she loves, all things that cost money. Sitting alone in our seats, away from everyone, waiting, I ask her why she doesn't want to be down there where everyone else is. Because I don't know if you can afford it, she whispers. Then leads her head into my chest, and I'm glad she can't see my face. Later, after the Orientals have been introduced, the pretzel throw themselves into the thick air, the circus runners turn off the lights. Over the loudspeaker, some asshole will tell all the kids to lift their glowing butterfly wands, lightsabers, laser pistols into the air and wave them proudly, show them off, and tell us over and over that if we want one, if we really, really want one, we can buy them from the men holding enormous bags lumbering up and down the aisles like mercenary Santas. The light of things pulse illuminating my daughter's face in hyphens of light as she stares across a sea of bright things, a thousand blinking promises never asked for, a thousand flashing neon signs telling her what she doesn't have. She's fine, I like this one. Don't worry about her. I'm gonna end with um, <clears throat> this poem, uh, and then Kalia will be up here. She's not as potty mouth as I am, I apologize for that. Um, no, I don't actually. <laughs> right, because there was nothing in my rider, my contract that said <laughs> No, like for real, like, I, sometimes I speak at Catholic schools and they're like, you will not blaspheme God. I'm like, okay, shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just making sure. Hopefully I don't get anyone in trouble. I represent myself. <laughs> my my opinions are solely mine and not of Mark Chang or Jay's American Studies Department or anything like that. All right, so uh, last poem, um, which I think I'm going to read because of this whole coronavirus stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm very afraid of insects. I always have been, always been scared of insects. And I was living in a basement place uh, that was infested with house centipedes. Uh, I don't know if you have house centipedes here in Chicago, but they're the ones with lots of legs. They're really fast. They look like mustaches, right? Uh, and the apartment was great because it had floor-to-ceiling bookcases, right? Built-in floor-to-ceiling bookcases, which is like, like nirvana for book nerds, right? Like, oh my God, they're just right there. <laughs> they're waiting for me to fill them with books, right? It's the best. But then they had the, and it was, and it was cheap, but they have these house centipedes. So I did research on them to like get over my fear of them. Didn't work. <laughs> you know, I learned that they're actually beneficial insects, they're like spiders. So you need to tolerate them as much as possible. That's not what I wanted to hear. Um, <laughs> but I wrote this poem about them. Not a swimming fish. <clears throat> a large centipede was in my tub for days. It looked like a prehistoric zipper made of needles. A firecracker with too many fuses. I skipped taking a shower for way too long. 
an unspoken compromise, hoping it would disappear on its own, preferring to be dirty over drowning my fear. Eventually, I trapped it under a container, took it outside while it scrambled like an explosion of exclamation points under the foggy plastic, and let it go. These centipedes are often mistaken for silverfish. They actually make dinner of them and mother more dangerous, damaging pests. I know what it's like to be mistaken for something else. To feel that the first reaction when a new set of eyes encounters your body is to want to smash you. To wonder what in history made a caterpillar a caterpillar, a ladybug a ladybug. To know what it's like to be invisible until revealed to be ugly, dirty, alien thing. Harry Wiggle, whose body tells the only story anyone is willing to hear. When it shook free of my trap, its head made of stepladders, its body a spasm of a hundred loose threads of fate, it didn't make a sound. But still, I swear I could hear a scream that it wanted to travel back in time, rewrite the many things of possibility that would shape how it would be seen, so that in the present, it could be in a place where it could be understood for what it really was. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, please uh, welcome to the stage, Kathleen. Thank you so much for having us. Paul, it's such a treat to sit there and listen to your story. We grew up on different sides of these. The Twin Cities. You grew up in Minneapolis, I grew up in St. Paul, but many of the places and the stories that he's referencing are the stories from my life as well. So it's particularly moving. My own story begins um, before I was born. America fought a Sikh war in Laos. It was Sikh war for the American people because the world was so unpopular. What happened to the mall, what is happening right now to the Kurds in Syria? So this is a history and a reality that is very urgent. And I've always felt it urgently. Growing up, I thought that I was going to become a medical doctor because my children, immigrants and refugees, were taught we need doctors and lawyers. My doctors heal what's broken in the human body. Lawyers protect the rights that we've never had enough of. My older sister, Dove, a year and nine months older than me, but she acts like she's the world older. You know, she won the North End Elementary School spelling bee a year and a half after we came. Wow. And so we decided that she was the one who was good for us. So she would become a lawyer, which meant that by default, I would become the doctor. <laughs> I have a very clear memory of being in seventh grade. My mom and dad were overdrafted in the bank accounts for our time. They're both working as assemblers on the night shift in the factories. My mom looks through the couches and she's looking for coins as if a few coins would balance the, the bank account. And I'm too young to get a job and I feel my own helplessness. I go to my room and I have this journal that I keep and I open it up to the middle, which I never do. I have actually a problem with leaving empty pages in between anything I write. But I go somewhere, somewhere in the middle and I press, I say, how does a writer become? And I'm pressing so hard that I break the page. And on the second page, I flip it over. I read the very last line in very tiny letters. I say, she keeps on writing, period. Yeah. That is my first real experience of wanting to be a storyteller. If I be a refugee camp where I was born, I could go to school because I could do this and then touch my hands with the other side. There were too many children and not enough schools, and they were looking for ways of keeping some of us out. And so I was kept out, which meant that I spent most of my days with the adults around me. Suicide was the number one cause of death. Long people got through three days a week because Thailand was practicing a humane deterrence policy, something like what serious as it's doing right now. Right? despite the pictures we see and the stories that are beginning to leak out. But Thailand didn't want any more Hmong refugees entering into their borders. And so in this place where we got 
two or three days a week. My mother fed me everything she could find. I looked at her, she would give me the food in her hands and the food in her mouth. My mother has six miscarriages after me. All little boys, big enough so that the adults could tell that they were little boys. But she had made a decision to keep the two little girls in front of her alive, even at the cost of the little boys that might come. In this place where I was born with all of the adults, there would be these cries that would come out all the time. Why are you dying here in this place that does not want you? Get up, get up, so we can go home. So I would ask them, where's home? For my grandma, it was a story on the other side of the river, in the high mountains of Laos. For my mom and my dad, they looked at me and they imagined some future somewhere far away from where I, where I was born. The only world I knew, the 400 acres that we shared with 40,000 other refugees. But my father he used to take me to the tops of the trees and he would hold me up in his arms and he'd say, look at your hand and your feet. One day, one day, my daughter will walk from the horizons. Her father has never seen you. Your hand and your feet will take you far, and I? In this place, I understood that little girls like me were sometimes traded for bottles of fish sauce. And so I was scared. My playground was the stretch of my mother's sarong, the hold of my father's hand. But my dad used to look at me and he'd say, you are not a child of poverty, war, or despair. My daughter is full being born, the captain of a more beautiful future. And I'd always believed him. Until we got to America, until I learned about movie theaters, right? Movie theaters where people can go and see a big screen and see people come to life, stories come to life. I'd never been to a movie theater. When I was a teenager, Titanic was in the theaters. Mm. One day, all my friends were gonna go see. And we didn't have cable, but every night at 6.30, Entertainment Tonight had a special on Leonardo DiCaprio. So naturally, <laughs> I was a lot of people. And on that particular day, my friends were going to go, but I couldn't go. And so I had to come home and take care of the kids because mom and dad were going to go to their night shift positions. That's how, that's, that's the way it worked. We went to school, then we came home, took care of the kids, then they went to work. You couldn't tell anybody because if child services found out, maybe they'd come and take us away. Then what would happen? We knew that mom and dad loved us. We knew how hard they were working so that we could be together as a family. So the roof would hold. But that day I walked home with this heavy bag of books and all I felt was the weight of the books on my back. I got home and my dad was sitting at the sofa, tying his safety toe boots, getting ready to go to work. I walked right up to him and I slapped the books down. I made such a big noise. My dad looks up at me and I told him, I don't want this life. I want something better. I want something more. That's all I planned, people. I didn't plan for the other part of the conversation. But my dad looks up and I think I'm breaking his heart. I can see it. His eyes, I think he's going to cry. There's liquid. But my father does not cry. My father tells me the truth that has always governed the whole experience. Right? We believe that before babies are born, they live in the sky where they fly over the clouds. From the sky, you can see everything. The course of the rivers, the trajectory of the mountains. And then I saw a young man and a young woman walking without shoes in a war that the world did not know about, where two thirds of my people have been killed and that I chose to come down to them. My father said that he would choose me all over again if he could. Then he got out, and as he opened the door to leave for work, he turned back to me and he said, life is gonna teach you the strength of the human heart, not of its weakness or fragility. And I, my dear, I didn't have the words to say anything to him, but in my heart I knew that those words that he had said, that they were important and I had to hold them close. The idea that I would become a writer, the reality that that was possible didn't happen until I was a senior at Carleton College. My grandma, this old woman who never learned how to read or write, she'd never been to school, who all of my life with her, she signed her name with a shaky X, the student was only. She took a fall my senior year. She believed that education was a garden that I cultivated in America and that one day we would reap the harvest together. I started dreaming about my grandma and me on Carlton's false spot. 
I wasn't interested in the buildings, but I wanted to walk with my grandma on the sidewalks because the, the landscape engineer that had designed the sidewalks at Carlton's mall spot had designed them after the Trail of the Deers. And I thought somehow that would take her back to, the, to that jungle in Laos and maybe it would connect her story to mine in a very real way. So I had these dreams that she was going to be there. Christmas break was around, I was about to leave, return back to school, and my grandma takes a fall. Her paperwork told me that she's 93, but grandma says she's over 100. She says that she's been way too long. But I go to my grandma, who had promised me in the refugee camps of Thailand that she would never die, because I was so afraid, because I used to cry and cry. I go to her and I tell her to get up. I say, Grandma, get up. And she looks at me and she says, I can't. And she looks at me and she says, there were people who loved me before you. Before you, I had a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters, my grandpa, my most precious little girl. There is no long land in the map of a bigger world, but I'm gonna climb this small mountain in my heart. I'm gonna swing open the door to the house of my youth. Everybody's gonna be there. Dinner's gonna be ready. And when they see me, they'll say, why are you so late in coming home? My grandma said it would be selfish of me to cry for her to stay. So I cried for her leaving. After my grandma died, spring was coming. She passed away on February 18, 2003. Spring was coming. The grass was beginning to green. The talk of graduation was all around me. And I looked around campus, I knew that nobody at that place knew that the most important person in my life was gone. That nobody cared. That the world would go on as if she truly had lived if I didn't try to do something about it. There was this opportunity to write a paper, but before the paper, I thought I should write my grandma one last love letter. Because all of my life with her, my grandma carried 13 suitcases. 13. She carried them from the house of one child to the next because none of them, none of them had enough money to have a house big enough so my grandma could have a room of her own. When my mom and my aunts went through my grandma's 13 suitcases, they found that last one full of just letters. They swept them into a corner. And when I walked close, I saw that it was all of the letters that my older sister Dawn and I had been our grandma, all of our lives apart. When she lived in California and she lived in Minnesota, and we we didn't have the money for the long distance phone calls. When Dawn went to Kenya to study African philosophy and I went to Thailand to study, to study the global poor, we sent her postcards. I picked up one of the postcards and we flipped it over and I saw that my grandma had read, read it so many times with her hands that the ink had run off and all you could see was the indentations that we made onto the page. So my very first book began as a love letter to my grandma to tell her all of the things that I would never forget about her. I was on page 37. I had a lot to say to her, you know? From her single tunes to her torn earlobes because she ran away from a tiger as a girl. Everything, there was so much. And it all just came out. And my father says to me, what are you doing? And I tell him I'm writing a love letter to grandma. And my father says to me, words that change the course of my life. He says, if you dream in the right direction, the dreamer never wakes up. The dream never dies. It always grows bigger and bigger in my life. What if the world can be strongly along with me? What if I could say to all the men and women who are teaching me about the world that you do not have to be a man or a woman of letters to have lived the life lessons worth learning from? And so as a 22-year-old, I went about writing my very first book. Knowing that I was still a victim of the semicolon and other grammatical structures. <laughs> I'm only going to read it off. I'll read this part. What I now know as a writer that I did not know then is that the best writing is writing that is, is writing that opens up my vision of the world, that teaches me new things that I didn't know already about myself, about the people I love, about the people who love me, about the world that we belong to, even if that world tells us often that we don't belong. And so one of the questions of my life is always, how do refugees become? Weren't we just all human beings at some point in time? 
I learned about the history. I knew that the CIA came and they recruited 32,000 more men and boys, the girls, seven, eight, nine, ten, to fight and to die on America's behalf. I knew this part, but when did we become refugees? And this was that very first answer for me. So this is right after the crossing of the Mekong River. My family has made it to Thailand. We just have about 10,000 that Lao soldiers. The group sat underneath a rustling bed of leaves for a few hours in silence. Everybody's hearts were tired. The islands of children were closing with exhaustion. They did not sleep, but they rested against each other very still. When the smaller ones began whimpering, the women said that the children needed food, so the men got up, saying there was little they could do sitting along the banks of the river. The family would walk into Thailand a little and see if there was food to be found. And later, when they could, they would find a way to help Uncle Ju's family escape. Uncle Angle had to lift my grandma off the ground. She leaned on him as they walked away from the expanse of the Mayfall River and Laos, a land that they loved, the land holding their brother, the land holding the grave of their father. The tattered group, six brothers, no longer seven, because Uncle Ju was gone, and their wives and their children and their mother did not make it far into Thailand before they were spotted by farmers. Refugees had been streaming into Thailand for the past four years since the Americans had left, and the Laotian government had started killing Hmong people. The village chief had been notified that a new group had entered into the country, and he sent word to the Thai soldiers. Men with guns waited for the group at the end of a dirt road. The farmers stood in place to watch the shivering group make their way toward the men in uniforms. A farmer on the road threw an old black t-shirt and a pair of tattered shorts at my father. The shirt hit him on the arm. The shorts fell to the ground in front of him. My father picked up the clothes and did not know whether to say thank you or not to the silent man who looked at him with unlucky eyes. My mother stopped her slow walking and waited for my father to put on the shirt and shorts. She loved him very much in that moment. She wanted to protect him from the life around him, but her baby held her back. I never thought I would see clothes thrown at my husband, she says, looking at the floor as if all the years had not erased a memory. When he, picked, when he picked the clothes off the ground and tried to wipe the dirt away, I could not look. My mother could only wrap her arms more securely around Doug. Her long hair fell about her shoulders. There was nothing to tie it back with. The wind blew the long strands into her face. Her hair had dried since the crossing. She was a proud young woman. I wonder if she hid behind the curtain of her hair and saw comfort in the small, unmoving baby with the fluttering lids. The Thai soldiers spoke to them in Laotian. They were informed that there was a place for incoming refugees to register with a group called the United Nations. After the registration, they would be sent to a fenced compound where they would stay until further arrangements could be made. They were told that they were in Long Kai, a Thai province, but that the refugee camp there was full. The soldiers told them that they were refugees now. Opiok, people fleeing for a home. Like times before, they were told to follow the men with the guns. It was not such a long walk, but the farmers on the road stared at them and every step felt stiff and hard. Maybe it was an hour, maybe it was less than that. They had no watches and they were too tired to count the ticking of time, too embarrassed in their rags with their hunger and their children, with bones jutting from thin shoulders. An expression on one man's face is the memory that my mother and father both carry, even 25 years after the fact. It was only a look, but it said that we were not human, too poor to walk the earth. It was in that image of that time man with his red and white turban wrapped around his head, looking at them making their way into his country, that my mother and father learned what it meant to be poor, to be without a home or clothing, to hide it. That's from the late newcomer. I wrote that when I was 23. So now meeting it right from, from beyond a decade, I can see things that I didn't see then. 
But with this memoir, I stopped to correct history, people. I was ambitious. I stopped to correct history. With the memoir. You have to use what is before you. My dad says to me all the time, you are not poor because your hearts are not poor places. And it wasn't until I became a writer that I understood those words and that I could live in them. I'm not poor because I'm very rich in stories. Not just the late homecomer, which some people, some writers thought I, I thought it was all I had inside of me after that book came out. They wondered out loud in front of me whether I was the author of just one book or if I was indeed a true writer. And so to prove them wrong, to prove to myself that I could be a writer, I wrote the second book, The Song Poet, right? So much more critically acclaimed than the late homecomer, but I will say this, books suffer sometimes the same fates as nation. That book came out in 2008. President Barack Obama had just been elected. All over this country, wherever I was invited, there were a few people who had come to see if Juan de Gran Torino had gotten it right, because Gran Torino <laughs> was hitting the theaters that year. You know, they came to see you know, if I read a novel. Because how could this war have happened? How could all these people be dead? How could there be Hmong people here if they, educated people, had not heard about it? How could it have happened? But that was a different conversation. The song Poet came out in 2016. In the space of those years, I was doing so many talks, learning how to stand in the words and not be on the page. But as my father would say, when I speak, I get to write on the fabric of a human being. When I write, I write on paper, right? In entirely different medium, same messaging. But I had to learn that. <laughs> Fell in love, had three babies, and then my husband was doing this dissertation. And I kept talking about this book that I wanted to write, and I'm not very competitive by nature, but he was doing his dissertation, and he was telling me to write. So I was gonna show him that I could write faster than he did. <laughs> so in two months' time, I was a bold of the song poet. It's about a bald man working in the factories of Minnesota during the economic depression that we just surfaced from. Very few people see this, though. They see that uh, it's a mall story, a refugee story, and that is about it, right? So many of us in this room understand that many of us, when people look at us, when they, when they hear us, when they hear our names, we're in Boston. There are only certain realms but where we're expected to write it. But it is about a poet's heart and how that poet's heart has allowed a writer to become, to come forth. It may be the language of the enemy. There's such a thing. And so this book is going to be an opera. I wrote the libretto for it which then tells you another part of my work. Right? I'm trying to correct history with memoir, but I'm also trying to enter spaces where more people have never been before, trying to open, make room in places where they think maybe refugee perspectives are not very productive or useful. And so how else to do that but to enter the world of opera? <laughs> so I wrote a libretto, and it will surface. Then there's this other part of my work that's really important to me. Right? There are the stories that we've been dying to write. There are the stories that we're born into, and we know that, that they're the great ones. Then there are the stories that we never, ever want to write. Every single woman in my life has lost a child, a pregnancy somewhere along the road. At 19 weeks, I lost baby Jules inside of me, our, our first pregnancy. And in the days after, I go on social media about how I had learned how to love somebody that only existed in the heart of me. I looked to the shelves that I love to find stories that would maybe make me less lonely, that would give me hope. But there were none. Instead, I found statistics. In this country, miscarriage and infant loss happen disproportionately to Native women and women of color. But on the shelves, there is nothing by or for us. But my good friend and uh, co-editor, Shannon, gave me had a stone birth at 41 and a half weeks. A beautiful little girl. She knew what I had experienced and she didn't reach out to me because she was fighting the same things. That in a world where so many of us are experiencing this kind of loss, there is nowhere, no place on the literary shelves for us to own our stories. And so she said, would you ever consider putting together a collection with me? And I told her, only when my child bearing years are through, but I know the shape of the story. And she said, okay. It took us five years. Last October, this one, this book came out. I'm really proud of it. What God has honored here, right? It's a miscarriage and infant loss, buying for Native women and women of color. There's some pushback. 
So white folks can say, why do you say it's for Native women and women of color? <laughs> they don't understand that we did this in part so that the Native women and women of color would know that the book is there. But of course, like all great writing, and I believe there's great writing in this book, it is about the human experience. If you're walking this earth, as some young shit, one of our contributors reminds all of us, if you're walking this earth, you come from the womb of a foreign kid. And so I'm really proud of this thing. And then there was something else. My good friend Balfi had, you came off your book when I was halfway through this one. And it was very exciting because this, I saw Balfi did it, I saw how well it was being received. And that was really, really good for my heart. And I think that's something that's really important for me to say in this room. That sometimes we look to each other for inspiration. Not to the dead white men who we're all taught to be, but to the living folk doing the hard work from the ground up. But this is based on a real story, and it's particularly important because it's about a little girl, my daughter, who crosses the street after our neighbor loses his wife. He sits there and he cries and cries, and one day we crossed over in Shenyang, and my sister's boys drew a map on his driveway, and after they were done, Bob said, what did you draw? And they said, we drew you a map into the world just in case we needed. If you know Grant Reno, you know that Grant Reno is Clint Eastwood, you know, he's the old guy that saves these bald boys, right, from gangs. This is the look of that story entirely. And it is a story founded on real life because this is what real life is. It's about little girls who cross streets, who understand that the things that they love, the beauty that they carry in their heart have a place in the life of another. It is this belief that I hold very dearly, that each and every single one of us, that we carry our path for all of humanity. And so I'm very proud of this book. On April 28th, we'll find out if it wins the Minnesota Book Award. It's a finalist, but it's a top year. Bob and I are both in there. It's a year. But I'm really, um, really happy to be here. Thank you for having us. And now we get to be in the same conversation. We never get to be in the same you can ask us anything. We'll both answer in whatever way we want to. So, so it's all good. Yeah, I, I did a talk at a high school. I said the same thing. Let's talk about anything. Mm -hmm. And they just wanted to talk about football, Vikings. Great. Right. <laughs> if it's basketball, it's worth the same. We can talk football. So, yeah, it's right there. Uh, this is actually a question for about what part of the account is your family from? Originally? Yeah. So, both of my parents are actually from the Taipei area, so the north. But after Dien Bien Phu, you know, the, so the French, the French ruled, colonized Vietnam. Dien Bien Phu was the battle in the 50s where the, what became the Communist Party kicked them out. So my parents were in the north. They moved south, not because of politics, but because my dad, you know, they were both from a farming community. My dad wanted to go to school. Uh, he wanted to get an education, but he was too old um, to get a free education by that point. But if you move south, so this is before the internet and before you could look up everybody's bullshit on, online. He was like, if we move south, no one knows who I am down there and I can get a free education. And that's why they moved south. And then, you know, the, the, the 17th parallel and then the division between north and south and then the war happened and my, my father and his brother enlisted in the Southern Vietnamese Army. So, we originally are from the north, but that's the history of why we ended up being in the south. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, so sort of related, uh, uh, there is a graphic novel that came out by G.B. Tran oh, yeah. in America. Are you familiar? Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. uh, because again, there's a great history pre post. Mm -hmm. So, I, I was just I guess I was just going to ask you, had you heard about it, and what are your thoughts on that? Love it, love it, love him and uh, T. Bowie's um, mm -hmm. graphic novel as well. Yeah, I actually wrote this revolutionary Vietnamese zombie apocalypse novel, and uh, GB actually was kind enough to draw like one picture mm. inspired by that uh, for this Asian American comic book anthology called Secret Identities Two. So, uh, yeah, that was like a dream come true for me. And maybe this is something you could talk about too. Like we're, you know, like you obviously are, I don't want to use the term trailblazer, but obviously 
becoming like a Hmong writer carries, there's the benefit of it for you, right? Where you're like, the, like one of the first public ones, but there's also a burden, right? Um, but like, but now, like as a, and as a Vietnamese person, I mean, I definitely felt that in my earlier years because, and maybe you can address this too. Like there were Vietnamese writers around, but a lot of those Vietnamese writers wrote just about the war. You know what I mean? And a lot of them were women and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, I was told like in the nineties that people don't buy Asian American men's literature. Yeah. Um, and now there's like Vietnamese writers all over the place, which is great. This is yeah. like the moment, yes. right? With yeah. maybe an ocean, yeah. we can boo, all yeah. we can we can name. And what is it? So how is it with Hmong folks? Such a good question. Um, you know, in the very beginning, I was so young, I was 22. I was driven with a great sense of urgency. All around me when people look, they never suggest that I was Hmong. I look Chinese, I look Japanese, right? I have a face that fits in most of Asia, not just Southeast Asia, but Asia. And so Mo is this thing that I carried inside of me. But I've always loved being Mo. I think that's really important for me to say. You know, I've always loved the fact that, you know, teachers are teaching us how to do a peanut butter sandwiches with bread knife, but at home we were wielding Mo knives, which look more like swords, yeah. right? <laughs> I've always loved the fact that I knew where, where my food was and all of these things. But of course I came with the bittersweet stuff. Christmas is choice for talks. You know, yeah. Thanksgiving was meals on wheels. Yeah. And you never get a whole turkey, people. You get a few <laughs> slices of turkey for us. Yeah. Like, how many years when the teacher asked us to draw our Thanksgiving turkeys, yeah. did I draw a turkey guys? Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's, there are all of these things. But the thing about my life is this. Even when I wanted to fit in, I couldn't. Mm. You know? Then you go to a school like Carleton, where so many of the, the, the your peers are so wealthy, and class isn't even a consequence or a thought, you know? Yeah. But you know where the rips are in your jackets. Yeah. You yeah. know you know how old your sweatpants are. I have a pair of sweatpants that was so old that the front facing pocket turned backwards, yeah. you know? Yeah. And because I'm stubborn, I'm like, I'm gonna keep on wearing them until they face up again, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, and so in a world where I was not normal, I didn't, I knew that my life wasn't gonna be a normal life in that way. Yeah. I knew that it was gonna be the difficult things that would make me who I am. And that that was okay. When I became a Hmong American writer, I knew that there were others who've been trying to trying to make an appearance for much much longer than than than, than, than I could only have. But they didn't have the benefit of an education like Carlton or a name like Columbia. You see, and so I wanted I don't want to sit up here and say that there weren't certain advantages that had been acquired on this journey that that helped me along the way. Yeah. But the thing that I've always been trying to do, and the thing that I try to do still, is I'm writing works that, that move me, move me to become a better human being, a deeper thinker, to feel without fear. You know, that is the big challenge for me. And so when I read the great works of art, I appreciate it for what it is, but I've always understood that my journey was going to be my own. You know? I love Marlon James, another Minnesota author that's nationally recognized. I have three little babies. You know? Never going to be like Marlon James. Maya, Maya Angelou, who doesn't, right? But my story was already so different, you know? And so I've gained and, and I've taken from these traditions in the most, I think, thoughtful way that I know how, in the most grateful ways that I know how. But I've always known that my journey would be singular to me. I hope that by the time, you know, I started doing national talks, right, that I would be even younger. But hey, yeah. it's taken me 16 years to get here to UIC. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just the nature of my journey. My first book came from a, a local press. Right? It was that local editor who told me I would rather you survive as a national writer than to die supporting a local press that sent me to my agent, that sent me to New York. And now that I'm a writer with options, I'm like, I still want to publish locally. And so I'm publishing locally with local presses, I'm pub publishing with university presses, and I'm publishing with New York presses. Because if I don't, people will question, can she get in? Is she good enough to get in? That's always the question, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, I was up for I was a finalist for this position, academic position, <laughs> and they said to me, you know, at the end of the day, mall is just not a priority. It was such a direct statement to my face, but it had been the statement of my life. When have we ever been a priority? Yeah. And so when I think about what the world expects, and when I think about what I have to deliver, right, I'm not afraid. They don't expect what I am. They expect always something that is less than me. Right? Yes. When I speak and I do a good job, people will say, Hmong folk too. 
because internalized racism is real, mm -hmm. they will sometimes say to me, you're not what I expected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Am I limited to four, nine and a half? <coughs> to the brown of my eyes? You know, look at the white streaks in my hair. You know, for every spoonful of rice, something was gained and something was lost. Yeah. So I'm allowed to claim all of the wealth and the breadth and the depth of all the stories that I'm connected to. Yeah. And can I touch upon something I think that you, that was very interesting? You know, so my tra my trajectory was a little bit different, um, but I really wanted to address something you said. Like there were, there are both advantages and disadvantages, yes. right? And then sometimes they can switch, yes. right? So, for instance, my what felt like a disadvantage back then was I was the only like I was doing spoken word, so I was doing performance based poetry, right? Yeah. Um, at the time, I was the only one doing yes. it, so I had the benefit of being first. And there came, there's benefits to that, because people are like, oh, people love like the first person who does weird shit, right? Um, you get tokenized, right? Um, but it felt like a disadvantage to me, right? It felt like a disadvantage because it felt lonely. Yeah. And I'm like, where are my people at? Like, am I like a token? Am I a freak? Like, what? You know, like, I didn't have a sense of community. I found that later on with other Asian American spoken word artists, but it was tough, right? Yes. Um, also, what became tough was I felt like because I came out of spoken word and a performance oral tradition that publishing houses wouldn't have, want to have anything to do with me. And so basically, and that was definitely a disadvantage, but what ended up happening is I tried to find success and build success outside of that community, away from the gatekeepers, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that even though that was a disadvantage, I actually learned a set of skills yeah. Does, does that make sense? I learned a set of skills and turned it into a strength. Mm -hmm. And I think that often those of us from marginalized communities have to do that all the time, right? Is if we, we turn disadvantages into an advantage somehow, right? Does, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, I'm always curious about Minnesota because I know it's, it's such an interesting, kind of unique mm -hmm. place. And yeah. It has a, such a specific kind of. Um, uh, not just not white, but like Asian yeah. population, yeah. Yeah. And refugee, et cetera, and such a thing, of course. And, um, so I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, like, how, what was your process of sort of uh, developing a kind of like sense of Asian Americanness and how you came to that? And then also in terms of like your writing too, like, how you, when did you become aware that there were like other Asian American writers yeah. or, or how did that come about that? Kind of that yeah. That's such a, so Minnesota has more refugees per capita than any other state yeah. in the nation, you know, and, and that's something that not a lot of people know about Minnesota, including the most, you know, linguistically diverse neighborhood, the Phillips neighborhood, you know, in the country, right? Um, at the same time, we always measure worse on, like, all racial equity matters, from the disproportionate number of men of color in jail to, 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 to getting on the streets, you know, to, to the... We have the low, highest achieving gap in many ways across our public schools. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to say this, but Minnesota's capital, St. Paul, the biggest population are in the public schools are Hmong kids. Very few people know this, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. As one of those kids growing up, you know, I, I, I love to be. There were no books about people like me. A, a few compassionate teachers with staple uh, make, make, make books for us. And they were the kind ones. Now, what was so moving for me when I held a map into the world for the very first time was that somewhere along the way, I, I had stopped believing that I would ever hold such a book, such a beautiful book that would center a story like mine. You know, it, it speaks profoundly to my heart, which is then to say this, to survive in Minnesota, your sense of yourself has to be really strong. Mm -hmm. You know, Bao and I are part of a community of writers of color that's very tiny, but it means that we know each other and in many ways, you know, different Wherever we go, we get to support each other's work from a different place, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so in that way, we have a very strong team mentality that maybe places in California, um, you know, yeah. they, they can be segregated by certain, like, Southeast Asians or, or different right. groups, right? Yeah. But we can't afford to do that no, and survive. Can't. Yeah. it would be like one of us. Like, my, my Vietnamese writing group is me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot. So I think maybe start with big picture. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting about Minnesota, and I think, you know, hopefully those of you who are Asian American studies people are familiar with the whole disaggregated data, right? What's interesting about Minnesota is we, could, we talk about racial achievement gaps, but they still don't disaggregate the data. And for Asian American people, it's tricky because the two largest populations of Asians in Minnesota are Hmong and adopted Korean, which are at the opposite ends 
Uh, and I'm not saying that adopted Koreans are just privileged. They have their own struggle. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at if you're looking at stuff like like per capita money, education, stuff like that, those two vast experiences are lumped in together. And we all know model minority. If the if the if the if the data is not disaggregated, then all of that gets hidden, right? Right. So we know about that. Hopefully, we know about that. And so that's why Minnesota becomes very interesting, right? Is that we have the two large the, the two largest Asian groups are at the opposite end of the spectrum in, in, in terms of that type of thing, which is very interesting. For me, growing up, I grew up thinking there were Vietnamese people and everybody else, right? Even the even the Southeast Asian people I knew, we fought like we fought like we did not get along. There's all types of bad blood between Southeast Asians. And it would erupt in my high school, you know, in the street, all of that stuff. There was a lot of uh, beef that went back to the war and homelands and stuff that had nothing to do with us. So there was a lot of inter Southeast Asian beef. There was a lot of like Vietnamese crews that didn't get along with each other. And that was, and then I was a socially awkward bookworm who didn't know shit about anything. You know what I mean? Like I idolized Luke Skywalker and, and like white Greek heroes. You know, I was a nerd who played Dungeons and Dragons and loved the library. I didn't know anything about anything. And so I kind of grew up in that. Uh, I learned about all the different struggles of different people of color and indigenous people before I learned anything about Asian people in this country. Um, my high school luckily taught a lot of, you know, there was an African American studies course. There was a Native American studies course. Um, when, I, when I was a high school student and I went to our librarian who was a very smart woman, uh, I asked her, I, I told her I was interested in literature by Asians. And she's like, um, there's short love club. You know, like that was it. And you know, I, I'm not gonna like, yeah. you know, let's us hold on the discussion. But you know, the whole thing is like, that was it. There was just one thing that I was told I could read if I was interested in Asian people. And that shit had nothing to do with me, you know? If, if that gives you a sense. I didn't know, I didn't really, I mean, I was part of the Asian group at my high school, which is Southeast Asian, and we tried to do stuff, but I, I didn't get that, you know, Asian people were also like Chinese people and Indian people and these, these other things for college. Um, there was a chemistry professor, Japanese American chemistry professor, who noticed that there were no Asian American studies classes. So she was like, I'm gonna teach this Asian American studies class. And I took it. She gave me a flyer on green paper. I remember it's on green paper. She was like, hey, you seem to be interested in ethnic literature, because I was. My freshman seminar was Native American literature. You seem to be interested in this stuff. Why don't you take my class? I'm like, oh, cool. And that's the first time I learned about all of this stuff. Does that make sense? And, and then just to drive it home, my daughter is growing up very similar to me. She's not learning any of this either. Fortunately, she has her mother and I. Her mother's an academic who's like does cross-racial indigenous queer women studies. So she's fine. Our daughter is fine. But I, I will say that that's different though. Like what you learn from your parents is different from what you learn in the classroom, right? Yes. So. Yes. Um, the both of you give talk all across the country. I'm kind of curious as like what the reception is like. I mean, I'm sure that some of these spaces are Asian American studies like what we have here, but um, a lot of them might be like, very different or that rich from very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you two, three brief stories, okay? This year I went to BYU, I was their alternate forum speaker, and uh, they told me that maybe there were several thousand students there, and faculty and staff. It was in a basketball arena. It was over 10,000. <coughs> BYU is an interesting place. The Mormons are at the forefront of language acquisition around the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's like 22 Hmong speakers in the audience. Wow. You know, it's an interesting place. Most under, like 60% of the undergraduates are married. And so there are babies, the best, well, most well-behaved babies <laughs> I've ever met in my life, in classrooms and stuff like that. You know, but, but they, they came out and they came out in those numbers because they understood that the story of the faith tradition that I came from was very, uh, very different from their own, you know? And so they came out to hear, did I deliver what they wanted? No, because I refused to submit a, a speech. I was the first person to give the forum all-campus speaker without notes, without submitted notes, right? Because most are reading off of teleprompter. You only have a certain amount of time, you know? But I sit there, and it's an interesting space because everybody's out there. It's too dark, so I can't see them. 
the, all the faculty are behind you, so your back is to the faculty. But I can see my mom and dad sitting there in the audience. And it was as if I was on an island all by myself. And I saw the look of my mom and dad's faces. And, and they were looking all around. When I was young, there'd be these specials of Michael Jackson. And we would all marvel and like, look up the faces. That was the look I saw my mom and my dad's face. Like, was, it, was I real? Yeah. And so I spoke to be real to them. I spoke so they were real to the world. Mm. That makes sense. Uh, I give a lot of school talks. One of them is an Apple Smooth Talk. This one happened like a year in. So a year into this process, I was doing over 365 talks a year. Wow. And this coming from a selective mute, somebody who never spoke, mm. you know, growing up in English. I didn't talk. My voice was super rusty. But to make the story real, I had to speak. And my dad, of course, in his beautiful way, tells me, if mountain tears can be incarnate, we would rain the world with our sorrow. But because they cannot, they can only greet the mountains of Kumbia. If you speak, if the winds of humanity blow, then maybe our lives are not lost. So I felt like this, this mantle of responsibility. But I went and I did, they made me do eight talks a day for a week. And at the closing convocation, in front of 850 people, one Hmong girl raised her hand. She asked me her question, if Hmong, why didn't you write the book of Hmong so I could read it too? I answered her in Hmong, and I could hear, for the very first time that week, of, uh, I could hear the voices of the crowd for the very first time. It was a group of young white men, and they were chanting, if you want to speak that language, go home. Oh, wow. And I could see the teachers, you know, standing and trying to make their way in, and I said, stop it. Isn't this why you hit me home? And I don't know what I said after that. It was 20 minutes of very blurry vision. But there was a line waiting to hug me, 827 hugs, in an audience of 850. But I was defeated after that experience. I had no more energy. Yeah. You know? And then I gave a public, school, public library reading the week after. And I was just going to read because I was already dead. I was just going to stand there and read. But then this old man, halfway through my reading, I look and he's on his knees. And I'm not sure what he's doing. In my culture, you can't let an, an elder go on their knees. So I go and I try to pull him up. He looks at me and he's crying. And he says, my body is tired. But there's so much more work for you to do in the world. Mm. I bow before you today to give you the energy to continue. Mm. I couldn't believe that. Mm. That's the nature of these talks. You go and you experience all these highs and lows. But you can only do this kind of work, you know, if you believe that you're changing the world each and every time. Yeah. Like when I entered here, I'm like, I don't care if you all agree or disagree. If you would walk out of these doors with more understanding in your hearts for my story, Fao's story, your own story, then we've succeeded. Then it's worth it. Worth that plain ride down that is so tough for me. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I agree. Um, before I answer that question, um, Thank you for teaching Asian American studies. Thank you for taking Asian American studies classes. I'm not just saying that because I'm brought here because of it, but you know, like I came from a generation where we students formed multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalitions to fight for ethnic studies on our campuses, including Asian American studies, fighting for stuff like this. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing us. And that kind of leads into like, Generally speaking, the only people who really bring me out are Asian American people. I rarely get, um, and that's a whole other thing about, like, you know, we can go on and on about student services, which have more money than Asian American studies and, and student cultural groups have a lot more money to pay big bucks to people, not me in the Calpharia, right? We can talk about that. Um, what I'll say is that uh, reactions have been all over the place. Um, I've been threatened by frat boys. Uh, I've been embraced by frat boys, uh, like literally. Um, I've had um, Asian people, including Vietnamese people, thank me. I've had Vietnamese people threaten me. Um, you know, because one of the things, like, just because we're Asian doesn't mean people are going to like us, right? I mean, some of the most, some of the most, like, cutting threats I've ever received were from Vietnamese people. And, you know, like, not because Vietnamese people are inherently evil or anything, it's just like, when you're, it's like being in a family, the closer you are to someone, you know how to hurt someone, right? And you might have history. For me, it's not having very leftist ideals. And you know, like, I don't know how many of you know the, the history of war, but a lot of Vietnamese refugees are here because the Communist Party, right? Like, they won. 
And and even though, and, and you know, like, so anything that sounds communist or socialist to certain segments of the Vietnamese community is very hurtful because it reminds them of the re-education camps or someone in their family getting killed. And if, I'm not trying to say any one side is right or wrong, but just to give you a, a sense that people don't, history informs our reaction to these things, right? So really the reactions are all over the place. And now that I read the kids, you know, uh, it, you know, I will tell you that I've been doing the spoken word thing going to talking for more than two decades. I've been in front of like hostile, drunk audiences who wanted to kick my ass. I've been, you know, in front of people who just didn't care, which is almost worse, the indifference. Yeah. Um, but nothing scared me more than reading, <laughs> you know, reading picture books to little kids because they have they have no evidence. They will tell you. They'll be like, this is boring. <laughs> right? They will tell you. And, and you know that they're telling the truth, right? But it's it's also wonderful. I'll just tell you a quick story. One of my favorite interactions, I just read at um, this, uh, all these kids, and one of them just comes up to me, and he was like, we have a lot in common. And he, he's like seven years old. Right? comes up to me. He's like, we have a lot in common. And I was like, okay, like, what do you mean? He's like, we're both Asian. We're both wearing pants. And we both know someone born during the war, right? Look at this little kid. And it's like, and that's what's great about it. They say something fucking powerful and painful and profound. And then they, they point out that you're both wearing pants. Like, you know, like, that's what I, you know, and I, I didn't expect it to be so much fun, right? So. It is fun, but you yeah. have to be very lively. Yes. Energy. Yes. Yes, you have to have lots of energy. Now, another side story, I went to do a talk at a public school in the Center, and it was a diverse talk. They don't have the kind of funds that can go through my agent. I did it for, because yeah. I wanted to. And and, um, and this uh, this young man, African-American young man, comes up to me afterward, and he says, he says, I'm in the system. I've never had a home. And I'm about to lose the home that I think I have right now. Mm. And he says, I have all these big feelings. I never knew what to do with them. But you showed me something. And I said, what? He said, you put your feelings before people. Mm. So that's what I'm going to do, mm. right? Really moving, really beautiful. Then this other um, young, uh, young man raises his hand. And he says, so I want to do the arts too. And I'm like, wonderful. You know, let's talk. And he goes, I want to do sexy comics. And I pause a little bit. I'm like, okay. And his friends said, we've seen them. They're great. And he, goes, yeah. you know? and he goes, do you think it's viable? And I said, do you hear the response? They, they've seen them. They're great. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The nature of actually what we respond to in these live talks, right? It's very different from like a reading group. Like when Bao and I visit people who read our work and they want to talk poetry or the craft of nonfiction, you know? And oftentimes they don't think we're qualified. And then yeah. when they do, you know, it, it's a very different conversation than the conversations that, that we're having with the community. And what you have before you today is two writers who work actively in the community, which is not always the case, right? Some authors only do the big keynotes, um, you know, but Bao and I are moving up and down all around. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, just, you reminded me of a story. So I did a workshop in prison and one of the inmates uh, was a writer he came up to me afterwards, he's Native American, and he's like, hey, like, you know, I just want to talk to you about writing. I'm a, you know, I'm a father too, and it hurts that I'm in prison away from my daughter. And like, you know, we're just kind of talking and vibing about all of this stuff. And he's like, I'm a writer too. And so of course in my mind, I'm like, oh, like, so you, you're probably working on a memoir about like Native Americans in prison or something like that. And so I asked him like, what's your book about? He's like, it's like Native American Hunger Games. <laughs> he was like, he's like, it's an action sci-fi thing. He's like, you're gonna love it. You know, like, and, and that's fine too, right? Like, that's fine because the world needs, like, those of us, I think, um, you know, we need stories like uh, Kalia's and mine. But we also, those of us who are people of color, we need joy and fun and uh, all of that too. Like, hopefully we're just, we're a part of a spectrum. We're a part of a conversation. You know what I mean? Um, we should not be viewed as like the ones like we're a part of it. Does that if that makes sense? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for um, both of you sharing your stories and your memories and family histories with us. I was wondering, like, what is your approach um, and your process for um, processing, but also uh, representing and most importantly honoring your stories and your family? And then also, what is that process like with your family? Yes. 
Um, what is your reception? Yeah. Are they involved in the ways that you represent your stories? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go first? No. no, should I? Okay, I can. Happy to. Um, you know, when I wrote The Late Homecomer, I wrote about my sister who had polio as a child. And so there's like a, a scar on her leg, like the sad face of a moon, and that one of her legs is shorter than the other. In America, when we moved here, the doctors created insoles. So when my sister is walking, you can't tell that one of her legs is shorter than the other. And I, when I told my mom, she was very protective. You know, she said, Nobody can tell that about dog, but you, you, you've written it down, do you want to? And so I talked to my sister about it, and she looked at me and she said, Tell you the world is so much uneven for so many more people. Mm. You know, if I can be that beginning, then let it be. Mm. My brother, too, in the, the song poem, I write very intimately about him. How he dropped out of school from the Anoka Public Schools. Um, and he, and I asked him, too, I said, too. I read this, do you want to read it? And he read it and he said, I would rather be judged for who I am than all of the things that I'm not. Mm -hmm. Now, when I talk to my other white writers who are working in the same kind of space, they tell me that they're at the dinner table, they're looking at their mom and they're like, how do I turn into a pop? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm in the opposite case. You know, when I'm looking at the people in my family, right? When other people are looking at my family, they see my uncle who wears flip-flops across the cold Minnesota winters. They don't know that there's shrapnel embedded in his feet. That, that's why he has to wear flip-flops, right? When they look at my brother, they see a young man potentially in a gang. They don't see the boy who offers me half an egg roll every single time he gets an egg roll, right? So the work that my stories and the work from where I'm positioned, the work that I'm doing is very different than, than like a white person. Um, and then this, this is important too. In nonfiction, when you're trained the way I am, you're trained never to give your readers, um, you, you never want to share your manuscripts with your readers before they're published. Mm -hmm. That's not how I feel comfortable doing it. You know, I think that's a question that's very specific to, to the writers. In, in August, I have a book coming out titled Somewhere in the Unknown World, and it's a collective refu refugee memoir, so 15 different refugee groups that I'm screening, quoting together, sometimes in the first person, against all professional advice, I gave it back to each person. And I said, is anything, you know, did I misstate anything? Is there any accuracy that you see in this? Only two of them chose not to read it, but everybody else came back and they said, you got it and you got it right. Because mm -hmm. that's important to me. I'm not interested in writing the definitive work of something, right? A Hmong family or the Hmong community or all of these things. I'm like, as Bao State is so beautifully, I'm part of the conversation. Next time you look at a Hmong person, I want you to reckon with the fact that the late homecomer exists. Mm -hmm. And they go, Gali Ya, right? Four feet nine and a half is somewhere in the world doing this kind of body of work. That's what I'm doing, and that's what's important to me. So the people I'm writing for and from know what team I'm on. Yeah. Always writing on behalf of the hungry ones, yeah. the refugees, right? What's your gas in their eyes right now? Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are many ways to answer this question. Uh, I'll start with a funny anecdote first. So the great, the great poet Martinez Spada just asked this question because he writes a lot about his in-laws, his family, and stuff like that. And I remember distinctly he was at a QA and a that asked this question. He was like, my family doesn't read my books. You know, he's like, you want to you wanna keep a family secret, put it in a book, right? <laughs> like he, uh, I had a good laugh. Um, and you know, and I have to say that my family is actually pretty similar. Like, they're supportive, but they're not really interested um, in my work. But that being said, I do feel a certain responsibility. And, and I think it's a constant tension. There's never quite the right answer. You just have to go with your butt. Guts. <laughs> well, that's my daughter. If she was here, she would, like, Love this it. conversation would be over. That's all I feel. <laughs> you go with your gut, and you kind of ask yourself these five questions. Like, for instance, uh, my heart and fast year was like, if I'm writing a poem about, my, about myself and I'm criticizing myself, then everything goes. I have the right, I have the right to write about myself positively, negatively, however it needs to be. When it's other people in my family, I ask myself some questions, right? Um, like the poem about my father and mother, I, I don't, I don't paint them as angels, but I'm giving you a context of who they are, right? Um, I sometimes when I write about them, I kind of step back. And it's kind of like, I think about like Asian American literature and how often we often criticize our parents and our parents' generation to a very white Western audience. 
that we might not intend to, but it comes out for us as very exceptionalist. Even if we're like lefty and progressive, we can, I think those of us in our generation can kind of do that. Cause that's, you know, it's kind of like, oh, my parents are racist in classes, but I'm not, you know? And what I really want to do is avoid that because if I'm going to write about that, I want to give a context to their struggle, right? I want to be weary that, I, I want to be cognizant of the fact that I have a greater platform as an English speaker with an en English speaker with a book deal and a college degree that my parents don't have. Like they can't come onto Facebook or Twitter or whatever and, and like kind of dispute that, right, in English. Does that make sense? And, and that goes across the board. Like I have a longer piece about cross-racial hostility growing up. Uh, like, like all of this stuff happening, I'm not ready to play the world yet because I haven't found the right way to write about it yet. Does that make sense? Even though it's true and it's real, I want to write about it in a way that's not pouring gasoline onto a fire. And I don't have the skill yet or the wisdom yet. And so uh, similarly in Thousand Star Hotel, there was a poem about my family that was one of my better poems, but I looked at it, I was like, I can't do this right now. I can't put this into the world. It's not ready, I'm not ready. Does that make sense? And I think that it's a it's a constant it's a constant gut check and it's a constant question of all of these different layers of you know privilege, platform, voice, you know, all of this type of stuff. It's a constant question. And I'll I'll just add this piece. I think Bob and I are now old enough. The Shannon would say we're seasoned chickens now, no yeah. longer spring hens. Yeah. Um, we're now old enough to understand that each thing that comes forth, each poem, each book, right? these are things that are only pictures of us in time, mm. you know? Yeah. And when you start out the way we do and you hope to accumulate a body of work, people, your readers, will see how you've changed and how, you know, the, the distance that you have to experience, how that informs who you are. The reality is that if your feet are still on the earth and you're still breathing, the human experience will keep coming at you. The stories aren't going to go away. They're going to keep on coming, right? But my grandma loved to say, surrounded by wisdom, without the experience to back it up, you don't know how to use it, you know? Yeah. And now in my 39th year, I'm only beginning to understand some of what she was saying in the space that she was saying it from. In ways that I could have understand when I was 22 or barely homecomer, or 27, 28, right, expecting my first child. Now that I'm three, my world has changed so much. The heartbeat of a child and the heartbeat of a bird are now one and the same in my hands, right? Which I would never have said previous to these experiences. You know, my understanding of love, now that we're, we're, we know each other a decade, has shifted, you know, has shifted. And the way I write of love is sounds so very different. My sensibilities are still what they were. I like flowers, I like things that are close to the ground, right? Or just look directly up to the tree, like the sky. I'm not just going to be tops, right? Those are my sensibilities as a writer, who I am as a human being. But I understand that I can't put all of me into any given work. You try to, yeah. but that's why we have more than one book, yeah. in, in theory, and yep. hopefully. Yeah, and I want to address something that you said in your talk. You know, what you said about having one book and people discounting you, like that's real. You know, like you get one book out and people just assume it's because the publisher wanted their token person of color that year and that's why they gave it to you. Like that's a very real sensibility that a lot of people have and they might not say it to your face, but you know, like definitely as a as a marginalized group with mm -hmm. one book, you're kind of like, yeah, you, you're very aware of that, you know, so. Anybody else? Thank you. No? Oh, you yeah. yeah, thank you talking is very inspiring. I'm kind of nervous right now, so I might not be able to articulate my words very well. Um, I really love writing, and, you know, like in high school, I was encouraged to write, teachers would love my writing. But um, every time I, like, try to write about my experience as a refugee, I would be faced with pity, and I don't want, I don't like that pity. Mm -hmm. um, what, what advice would you give me to, like, face this pity? You know, for me, um, and, I, and I think when the late homecomer came out, I was such a young mother, you know, and uh, there were people who looked at me and they wanted to see me as evidence that the American dream was what, good and what, you know, that I was an example that in, only in America can you take a kid from the refugee camps and the housing projects, give her an Ivy League education, and give her the kind of platform to do the work that I was doing. But at some point, I realized I wasn't given. I had to take it. You know? 
which is not to say that there weren't good people in places when I needed them to be there, to see me and to hear me. But the truth is now when most people hear me talk or they come to my things, I don't think pity is the overwhelming emotion when they walk out of the room. But you know, and I know, that sometimes tears fall from other people and they're not falling for the right reasons, right? Yeah. And now that I'm much older and in many ways, I think, a little bit wiser, you know? I, 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 can, I can respond to those tears in more thoughtful ways, but I have to be honest with you. We begin where we are, but we have to be kind and have a patient and have with ourselves to give, our, uh, to give space for us to mature in our perspectives of ourselves and the world, just as much as the world isn't ready for you. Yeah. You have to need it. You have to be ready for it. Yeah. It's a two-way learning street. Yeah. And for women of color particularly, so often we don't give ourselves food to do that learning that we need to do. I am who I am today, but there's 16 years behind this, right? And before that 16 years, there was what? 20 something odd years, right? There was one man and one woman who believed. Who believed, yeah. right? Yeah. That's sometimes what it takes. Yeah. But we begin where we are. The pity is where you are, that it is where you are, and to recognize it as you're doing, right? That is the beginning to something else, a story that will go somewhere else, and that is the process of life. That is the skip that we have. Yeah, beautifully said. I agree. And I think the question is a very interesting one, and I don't have a, I don't have a final answer. I think that that is a constant tension for anyone who writes about difficult subject matter. Even if you're not a person of color or a marginalized person, if you're writing about difficult subjects, the line between writing truthfully and honestly and a passion for it, right, is a constant struggle if you write about difficult things. Does that make sense? And I don't have an answer for you. If you write about difficult things, you will have a reckoning about and, and basically, eventually, you develop you develop a sensibility about it, and your sensibility might be different from another writer's, right? Um, so I, I know that sounds wishy washy, but I think part of part of it is being in the world, reading other people's books, forming your own opinion, forming your own forming your own compass for that type of thing, right? Uh, one thing that I like so much about Viet Wins the sympathizer. Right, uh, who won? Who won the Pulitzer for it? Right. Mm -hmm. What I love about that book is that, unlike a lot of Vietnamese American literature that I had read, the protagonist in that book is not necessarily a reliable narrator. Right. He's not necessarily a good guy. I think sometimes those of us who come from marginalized communities, we like have an urge to either like present our protagonists as heroic because we're so scared of like portraying our own people as negative that we, we make them into heroes or conversely we throw them under the bus and we make them villains, right? What I love about his book is that the protagonist is not just a victim, right? Like he's been through shit, he's a Vietnamese person, and so all of that is context, but he has his own agency. And some of the stuff that he does is not good. You know what I mean? And that's what I like about it. And, and maybe a more pop culture um, representation of this is that movie Birds of Prey. Uh, you know, with all that, like, with Harley Quinn and, and the women who are, right, who are kind of like villains. Uh, I like the movie a lot, not just because it was a fun action movie, because it was, but it's also like a bunch of women who, who are kind of faulty and they make mistakes. They're not like super heroic. You know, they, they make some bad choices, they make some good choices. They're human, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think sometimes those of us who marginalized communities have this pressure where we're not allowed to be human. And sometimes we internalize that pressure. And we kind of like, you know, um, we start ha we start like writing towards that pressure, like, oh, I gotta make this a hero, or oh, I gotta make this a victim. And we all know that the reality of it is it's not that simple. Like, human beings fuck up and we make mistakes. Just because you're oppressed doesn't mean you're a noble person. Doesn't mean you're going to do the right thing all the time. We know that. You know what I mean? But part of it is, as a reader and a writer, you read, you form your own opinion, you form your own compass, and you just do it. Be patient. Yeah. To yourself. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.